uh, we have our first uh, episode of uh, LEC Conversations or Lucid Talks. And uh, we're going to talk with Dan Sachs, and he was our former um, uh, justice teacher. And he has a really interesting background, so we're going to talk to him now. Good evening. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Hi. How are you doing? Fine, thank you. Nice Hi. to have you here. Yeah, no, thank you so much for giving us the opportunity to talk to you. It's, You're very it's welcome. Really good. Yeah, um, I think um, you had, you know, we had you as our justice teacher, so, but a lot of people won't know your background and, you know, what you do, so you might want to, like, introduce yourself just briefly. Sure. Well, um, as you know, Ruba, I'm, I'm originally from the United States, but I've lived in Holland uh, for almost 15 years. Um, I'm a lawyer. I, I guess you could call my, my professional background as slightly um, unorthodox or untraditional because uh, I was a prosecutor in the United States for a while. Um, but the work that really sort of changed the course of my life and ultimately led me to come here to Holland was mm -hmm. uh, in a long, long time ago, uh, in the early 1990s, I, I spent almost five years working in Guatemala, uh -huh. in Central America. I was working for the Catholic Church. And at that time, there was a civil war going on in Guatemala, uh, which uh, resulted in a huge numbers of human rights violations, um, civilians caught in the crossfire between uh, the Guatemalan army and the Guatemalan insurgency. And so I was helping the Archdiocese of Guatemala set up a human rights office that tried to assist innocent victims of this conflict. Right. Um, and that work, uh, the office that I helped set up, helped push through the Guatemalan judicial system, the first prosecutions of military officers uh, for abuses committed against civilians. So that's where I was first exposed to what we call war crimes, crimes right. against humanity. Right. And it was that work really that eventually led me to come to Holland because after I oh. was working in Guatemala and then I went back to school and I got an additional d degree in human rights law, I had the opportunity to come here to The Hague uh, and I worked as a prosecutor at the United Nations International criminal tribunal for the former Yugoslavia. So I came uh, in 1998 and I was working there as a prosecutor on a number of different trials and investigations until 2010. Cool. So that's my career in a nutshell. Yeah, yeah, yeah no. But how, how was it, how did you get into teaching after that? It seems like a sort of a drastic change to me. To well, yes and no. Um, I had always thought Earlier in my career, I mean, I've always enjoyed teaching. I've never been a, f I've never taught formally, you know, like mm -hmm. full time, but I've given over the years lots of talks and lectures, and I've always enjoyed working with students and, and, and young people. And so I always thought, well, at some point in my career, when I'm older, whatever yeah. older means, um, I'll try perhaps to make a transition into, you know, teaching. Um, but hopefully teaching on the topics that I've been working in for so many years. Right. Um, and in 2010, I was very, very lucky because I, I was um, awarded a, a visiting professorship to teach international criminal law and international humanitarian law at the University of Cambridge in the UK. So I had this wonderful opportunity to try teaching for a year. Yeah. So you're the you're a visiting professor there, right? In law. I was. You I were. Was. I was. Right. I was. I was. It was. I was supposed to be there for a year. <clears throat> I ended up being there for two years. Right. And then uh, last autumn, I was back here in Holland, and I taught international criminal law at mm -hmm. the University of Utrecht. Mm -hmm. And then during the winter, um, yeah, I was a visiting professor teaching global justice at LVC. Okay, yeah. and we were just talking about like the difference within uh, sort of the you know institutions in the Netherlands. So mm -hmm. you taught at uh, Utrecht as mm -hmm. well, mm -hmm. and then at LUC. So how mm -hmm. did you? What was the difference between that? The well, scale. Well, yeah, I mean, in, in I mean, both at both schools, I had really good students, okay. um, uh, and good. very my my classes at both Utrecht and, and LUC, of course, they're very international. Um, 
but the difference was at Utrecht, uh, it was sort of a standard large lecture class. Right. Uh, and so I had almost 70 students in my class, and we met in this big old lecture hall. Mm -hmm. And so most of the class, I mean, the format of the class was primarily me lecturing and right. you know, with occasional questions coming from students. Uh, but it was primarily me lecturing, whereas my experience at LUC so far, it's been with, you know, a, a small group kind of mm -hmm. seminar yeah. where it's been much more sort of discussion-based, um, which in, in some ways, in some ways was, was a lot more fun, I think. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was going to ask, like, which one do you think is more effective for students as well, to have more interaction or just to... Um, I, that's, a, that's a very good question. Um, I think it's probably more effective the LUC method um, because <laughs> students have the opportunity to interact a lot. Yeah, and, and, true. Um, or at least the course that I taught at LUC. Um, but um, you know, depending on how popular a course is, what the demand for it is, you, you can't always have that small group experience. It's, no, it's exactly. just the way it is. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. just the way it is. So. And just, I, went, I was really wondering about the way, like the teaching style, because you, I mean, every teacher has their own sort of way of teaching. Mm -hmm. um, we also had other sections of, uh, of justice, and mm -hmm. not everyone had a movie night, for example. So how do you, you know, how do you sort of like to teach students, and what's your way? Is it different from the others? Is it? Well, I, I assume it's probably different, but I'm not sure because, to be honest, I haven't really had the chance to watch other teachers very much right. because That's you're true. in class teaching mm -hmm. and they're in class teaching. Mm -hmm. um, I personally, I really enjoy engaging students. Yeah. Um, not only engaging with students, but, but trying to get students to engage with themselves and to sort of mm -hmm. challenge themselves to, to, to think things perhaps a bit more critically, to explore ideas a bit mm -hmm. more deeply. Mm -hmm. Um, because I think that's fun, and I, and I also find it, as a teacher, it, it's rewarding exactly. when I'm able to help a student develop their understanding of a particular area or a particular topic yeah. um, more, than it, more than, than it was when the course started. Yeah. That's, that's cool. I mean, yeah. that's, it's a challenge, yeah. um, but it's also very rewarding. Yeah, know, so, yeah true. Yeah. And how is your, because you've been here for a while? Almost, you, almost 15 years. 15 years. Yeah. How is your sort of like integration? That's Dutch. <laughs> no, so I, know, yeah, I heard that like, it's, it's, it's yeah, everybody's it's, it's doing more, it's like, Netherlands so. is more like, it's very difficult, yeah. yeah. But I'm working uh, on my Dutch. Yeah, so. how's, how's it going now? Is it? <laughs> it's, it's a lot better now than say a year ago because over mm -hmm. the last year I've, I've really put a lot of effort into it and yeah. I have a private teacher and, um, so it's a lot better than it used to be, right. and I can read a lot now. Like I, I can, with my dictionary, I can read the newspaper, and right. I can watch the news and, and understand in general what they're talking about. But yeah. um, speaking is very difficult. Still. Yeah, yeah. I, I can understand. Yeah. Go, going back to your uh, sort of profession that you had before, um, going back to cases, for example, mm -hmm. how. Um, how do you reflect back on that, and what do you think? Did you have like a case that was really, really difficult to handle, or something mm, really? It's a good question. That you remember? There are all with? any case, any um, any international uh, criminal trial is going to be a difficult case. Yeah. Uh, it's just the nature of them. They're often massive. The, the crimes that occurred are often massive, enormous. Exactly. Yeah. Very traumatic uh, yeah. to the people who were victimized. Um, lots of complicated issues, factual issues, and legal issues, and sometimes political issues mm -hmm. wrapped around the other issues because you're trying to investigate a uh, crime, a crime or a series of crimes that occurred in a different country. Exactly. And so you need the cooperation of the government of that country, which mm -hmm. may or may not be forthcoming due to mm -hmm. political interests. So, and the trials themselves, they're, they're, because the cases are big and complicated, they, they tend to be very long. Yeah, exactly. So they go on for a long time, uh, so they can be very tiring. Yeah. But um, 
at the same time, very interesting. It's always interesting. Yeah, it's never dull. It must consume a lot yeah. of time of year, of course. Enormous and amounts of time, yeah. yeah, which is what, for example, it's one of the reasons why I wasn't able really to study very Netherlands very much right. before I left the ICT. Yeah, there was true. just no time, no time yeah. or energy. Yeah. Yeah. But um, no, I was very, very fortunate. I worked on some you know, incredible cases. Yeah. yeah. No, that's so. Do you remember any like any cases like specifically, <clears throat> or? Well, so I can. Rem I I mean, there's sort of three <laughs> that probably three trials that I worked a lot on for that for different reasons were particularly exciting to me. Um, one case it's known as the Yamarska trial, um, but it 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 involved five men who were accused of setting up and operating what were effectively concentration camps in the summer of 1992 in the Priador area, northwestern Bosnia and Herzegovina, uh, which back in 1992, when pictures came out of these emaciated men standing behind barbed wire, it became a very famous, um, a very scandalous situation. And so that was uh, a very exciting trial to work on. Um, and then after that, uh, I spent more than four years working on the trial of President Slobodan Milosevic, who was the former president of yeah. Yugoslavia, <coughs> um, yeah. which, again, very complicated case, very, very difficult, um, and at the end, of course, very sad, sad because he yeah. died before the trial ended. So, of course, that was... Um, uh, you know, that was that was a difficult moment because uh, that was not the outcome that we wanted. No, exactly. But going back to that particular case, uh -huh. how do you think his death sort of had an impact on people's views on his case? Because mm -hmm. it changed a lot, right? Because you know, you know, people accuse the ICTY actually for his death, mm -hmm. and it, no, it's a good question. And and his death before there was a verdict. <laughs> Uh, oh, it affected opinion um, in different ways. First of all, there was sort of the, uh, the conspiracy theories yeah. that you mentioned that yeah. you know, he had actually been murdered by the, yeah, by, by the ICTY, which, of course, it's rubbish, but you can't convince people if, if they have a particular belief that's something they want to believe. Um, it also uh, engendered a lot of criticism of the trial, uh, the prosecutors, the judges, and the institution itself, um, because of that particular. Tr there were different reasons why that particular trial went on for so long. Right. Um, some of them had to do with mistakes that were made by the prosecutors, by the judges. Some of it had to do with health problems that Milosevic had. Right. But the combination meant a trial that dragged on too long. And so there was a lot of criticism of the institution for that. Um, but quite frankly, a lot of that criticism was justified. Yeah. Um, I mean, sometimes criticism <coughs> can be healthy. For example, his yeah. medical condition, he was not, he was denied uh, medical treatment? He was, was never, he? oh no, he was never denied medical treatment. He always had excellent medical treatment. Okay, yeah, no. because that's one of the, you know. One of the it? legends about, no. <laughs> no, he had very good medical treatment, mm -hmm. but... You know, there are issues about, did the prosecution create a case that was so big because President Milosevic was defending himself and because he had, in particular, a serious heart condition, yeah. was it unrealistic to expect that he would be able to stand the strain of, the, of such of a case, big yeah. trial of representing himself? Because he, and frankly, he worked very, very hard during the trial, right yeah. until the end. Um, so, I mean, some of these criticisms though, are, are, are valid. Yeah. So in the end, do you think it was fair? I think it's a really difficult question, but... Was, were the proceedings fair? Yeah. Um, the kids. I think... Yeah. Uh, <laughs> my overall answer, I would say yes. Would there be things I would have done differently? In, um, yes. Um, I think... It was a mistake to let, pres in terms of fairness, for example, one of the reasons why the court allowed President Milosevic for most of the trial to represent himself, it's because under one uh, legal system, the common law legal system, which mm -hmm. 
for example, includes the United States, where I'm from, and England, and Canada, and Australia, the right to represent yourself is considered a very fundamental right. Yeah. And so most of the judges, I think, felt, well, if this is a fundamental right, we have to uphold it. But I think that strategy backfired because when a case is so complex, when it, it, we're not talking about a shoplifting case or no, a drunk exactly. driving case. We're yeah. talking about really incredibly complicated cases. And so cases at that level, I don't think it was fair to have President Milosevic defending himself. And, and in fact, in many countries around the world, including Holland, uh, including the countries of the former Yugoslavia, because it's a different legal system with different legal philosophies, right. um, Milosevic would not have been permitted to represent himself. It would have been mandatory that he have a defense attorney. So there are different views in international law and from country to country as to what is fair. Yeah, that's and true. That's just that's, the way it is. I there, think there, that's are, a really there are different. Yeah, exactly. there are different views. Reasonable minds can differ as to what fairness means. Exactly. Yeah. That's, that's true. In this case, it didn't work out. Yeah, in spite of people's good intentions. Yeah. yeah. So going back to uh, your, your, you know, our former justice classes, how do you see LUC students? I mean, it's, I mean, like their potential maybe, or like sure. what they might do later on. Okay. Well, I mean, I mean, in general, I think most LUC students are, are really good. I mean, there's a lot of very smart and, and, and very talented people there. Um, so in many ways, it's, it's really, you know, it's a privilege to teach there because you're 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 interacting with with you know very talented people. Mm -hmm. um, only you're trying to help them become just a little bit more talented. You know, yeah. um, you, you know. I think I mean the sky's the limit for for many students. I mean I I mean I, I see differences in students, yeah. or, or I saw differences in students. Uh, for example, in the seminar that, that, that we had together in, in, in Global Justice, um, some students, I think, arrived at LUC perhaps with more self-confidence in their academic ability. Mm -hmm. And so part of my job is to try to keep those students challenged, but then also try to raise the self-confidence of other students who, who, who need to have a bit more confidence, you know, either either in, for example, their writing ability mm -hmm. or in their um, in their speaking ability, you know, speaking in front of a group or, or just even sort of debating issues in class. Mm -hmm. um, so I see I s definitely see differences there, um, but I think that's a question of you know the individual development of students and some people. Uh, perhaps because of their high school backgrounds, whatever, just we're at a different stage of development. Um, some students, I thought, uh, could work harder than they do. Um, and I told that to several students. And, you know, you know s several students, you know, who I thought, wow, these are very smart people. You know? And they have the, the, the capability of doing really good work. And the work that they did in class was good, but I knew they could do better, <coughs> could be better. sometimes even a lot better. Right. Um, and uh, so that's also, as a teacher, that's sort of a challenge, just trying to figure out how to motivate certain students, uh, even though they're already very smart, very talented, very good students, <coughs> but to be better, because they yeah. can be better. But yeah. that's important, because... Um, you know, it's a competitive world out there, yes. and it's and it's important in terms of your own success in life, but also I think for your own self-respect that you you do is the best you can on whatever it is that you're doing. Mm -hmm. you know? um, so that was an ethic that I tried to instill. Yeah, I noticed. Although, <laughs> although it, <laughs> at, yeah, although some some students responded to that, and some students uh, a bit, but they could respond a bit more. Yeah. yeah. And I'm going to tell them that the next time I see them. <laughs> so, um, uh, what kind? I mean, you just you taught justice, but are there any other particular courses, or maybe do you want to like introduce a new course to LUC, something that would fit the 
global challenge theme of LAC? Oh, that's an interesting question. Um, well, if I, if, you know, if, if I teach at LUC in the future, I mean, certainly there, um, there might be other kinds of courses uh, that I could introduce. Um, I noticed, for example, that some students in our class uh, were quite shy uh, or some were less organized than others in terms of public speaking. And so I would enjoy working with students on yeah. public speaking yeah. and advocacy. Um, because I think that's a very important skill for the future. I would also, I think, I think it, I think it would be interesting to have, to see if students, and perhaps, maybe not first year students, but perhaps third year students, perhaps they could also design with guidance of their professors and the administration, they could design perhaps some of their own projects um, which might be related to, um, you know, sort of the ethos of LUC and what, what LUC stand, what LUC represents here in the Hague. You know, a, you know, a, an institution of of higher learning, sort of dedicated to the principles that make the you know the Hague, the city of peace and justice. And I can see giving, trying to work with students to see if they can develop particular ideas, entrepreneurial kinds of ideas for projects, um, whether they're academic projects or development projects, or, you know, justice related projects, um, related to the core focuses of, of, of LUC. Um, um, you know, in other words, if students might want to come up with ideas for a particular, to create some kind of research project to create some kind of institution mm -hmm. uh, that would involve um, working to further the goals of, of, of LUC itself. Um, trying to perhaps combine the theory that you're learning in the classroom mm -hmm. uh, with a bit of practice and, and, and the reality of the real world out, outside, of, outside of, of LUC itself. Yeah. Um, I think that might be interesting, but that's something for the future. I, I know that LUC um, in the future, I think, is going to develop its own graduate school, in other words, master's programs. Right. Um, and I think that could be a very exciting challenge uh, to try to find um, particular areas of study and research and curriculum for students to go beyond what they're getting in, th in, in their three years in LUC mm -hmm. and, take, and take their learning even further. Yeah. Um, I think I think it's a, it's a fantastic idea, yeah. yeah. And I think it's going to be a very exciting part of LUC in the coming year. Yeah. So getting that. Yeah, for sure. Going back to uh, public speaking, you just mentioned uh -huh. how I think you mentioned it in class, but it would be nice to share. How did you sort of overcome your fear of public speaking? I think it's really useful also for LUC students because they have to present sure. all the time for different courses. Yeah. So I think it's a really great idea to. Yeah, I, 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 um, I am a pretty good writer. Like people have told me mm -hmm. that I write well. All through, like when I was a student and then after I started working as a lawyer, people, I seem to write well naturally. That, that's mm -hmm. sort of something that comes to me kind of naturally. But I don't have a lot of natural ability as a public speaker. I don't. That's something I really had to, not only did I have to work at it, and I still work at it, mm -hmm. but I was really terrified of the idea. I was always extremely nervous when I had to get up and, and, and speak in front of people. And it's actually one of the reasons why I decided to become a prosecutor right. in the first place. To overcome you know, those fears. To, I said, I've got to do something to get over this. Yeah, and yeah. boy, becoming a prosecutor or a defense attorney, when you when you have to go to court every day and stand those, up and make yeah. arguments, that you get over those fears, mm -hmm. um, you know, during the first year of that work, and it makes you better. Yeah. It makes it stretches you in ways that that you just can't you, you can't learn from a book. Um, so you're, it's it's very valuable. Yeah. But I can also assume that that also really helped you as a teacher to teach like in I, front of class? I think so. I, I, I'm convinced that all of, for example, all of the trial work that I did, yeah. you know, over so many years on my feet in, in the courtroom, mm 
trying to convince either a jury in the United States or judges here at the ICTY of a particular position or of making particular arguments. Yeah, I mean, that. I think those kinds of communication skills, in particular, the ability to take a very complicated issue or idea and break it down into simpler bits and simpler ideas so that people <coughs> understand them, Mm -hmm. um, I think all that experience helps me now as a teacher. And yeah. Uh, I think it makes That's, me a better teacher. Yeah, yeah. I can imagine that. Yeah. Wow. Thank you so much for your time, and it was really nice talking to you. No, so. well, no, the <laughs> pleasure is mine. No, yeah. thank you so much. Thank you for, for, for inviting me to speak to you. It was really yeah, fun. Yeah, no, it was really nice. Thank you so much. You're welcome.